Welcome on this eighth Sunday of Pentecost, July 18th. We continue today with our third in a series of services about hymns and their authors and composers. And today we head to the early 1800s in the pioneer west of Minnesota. Our special missions this summer are the Bridges Outreach for First Presbyterian and our local food bank for Myersville. And of course, the regular expenses of the church continue, salaries, building upkeep. So please try to remember to keep up your regular financial commitment to the church. First Presbyterians, Pastor Emeritus, the Reverend Dr. Thomas Peters, passed into the church triumphant last week. And I ask you to keep his family in your prayers as they and we grieve this difficult loss. There will be a memorial service on July 31st, and you're welcome to call the church office for further details about what time and where. And now, let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship by responding with the words on the screen. I will sing of your steadfast love forever, O God. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. Your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Now let us pray. O God of all creation, Open our hearts that Christ, the King of glory, may enter and rule our lives. Give us clean hands and pure hearts, that we may stand in your presence and receive your blessing. We pray in the name of Jesus, the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. Paul, Timothy, and Silas went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come opposite Mashiach, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mashiach, they went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside of the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Sometimes it seems like the people in the Bible are not like us. They're somehow better, holier. Though we do have Sarah's laughter at the idea that she'd have a child in her old age, and we have Moses' many excuses to not do what God wanted him to do. We have King David's shenanigans, the Apostle Peter's denials. But somehow we still think that the people in the Bible have more holy lives than we have, that the people in the Bible have no life other than what we read about their relationship to God and their ministries. Well, today we get to hear about people that, though they lived in different times and different places from us and from each other, are people of strong and vibrant faith and yet have lives that may look in a way more like ours. Much of the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, is a travelogue of Paul's journeys. Scholars have sorted out several kind of separate missionary journeys of Paul, accompanied by various assistants, different assistants joining him at different parts of the trips. On his second trip, Paul started off from Antioch and headed with his friend Silas around the eastern edge of the Mediterranean through what's now Turkey and then picking up another assistant, Timothy, stopping off in several places and then getting to the edge of the Aegean Sea at Troas. At Troas, Paul had this dream in which there was a man standing across the Aegean Sea from, from him in Macedonia, pleading with Paul to come and help them. And so their journey continued across the Aegean, eventually to the city of Philippi in Macedonia, named for Alexander the Great's father, Philip of Macedon. Well, Philippi was a sizable city, a, a Roman colony, and it was an important trading center. And Paul and Silas and Timothy were there for several days. And on the Sabbath, they headed to a meeting that was happening beside a river for worship for the Jews of the city, since there did not appear to be a synagogue. And remember that the earliest Christians were Jews, and Christianity was, at first, perceived as kind of an enhancement or an enriched form of Judaism, a new kind of Judaism. Well, Paul preached there to this Jewish congregation about Jesus. And 
At some point in the morning, Paul met there a woman named Lydia. Now, Lydia appears to have been a, a pretty substantial person in the community. She was a dealer in purple cloth, purple being a color of, of wealth, of royalty, and a color which required dye that was very expensive to make. So in order to buy and sell purple cloth or purple dye, Lydia had to have had considerable financial resources available. She had to have had capital to invest in a business that required a pretty big outlay of funds. So we know that Lydia was a businesswoman. She was probably head of her household. She probably owned her own house and had employees that depended on her for their livelihood. And we know she was a person of faith, also taking a break from her work to worship God out by the river outside the city. And she heard what Paul was saying about Jesus. She was moved, she was affected by it, and she decided to be baptized along with her family along with perhaps her household, which would have included servants, as well as you know, extended family members. And she then invited Paul and his companions to stay at her home while they were there staying in Philippi. And this relieved Paul of having to earn a living while he was there, his, his day job of making tents. And so her invitation to them to stay with her freed him up to go spend more time in his missionary work. Lydia found her calling, her vocation, not in dropping everything to follow Paul and preach and teach, but in the continuation of her purple dye and cloth business, setting an example for her household, supporting financially Paul's ministry and the work of the new church that was forming there in Philippi, and being a leader and organizer in that church. Her newfound faith in Jesus Christ changed her life, redirected her focus and her purpose, but in many practical ways, her life just continued as it had. She lived in the same place. She conducted her business with the same integrity and acumen, serving her Lord in her vocation of businesswoman. Our hymn stories over the past two weeks have taken us from English slave ships in the 1800s with John Newton and Amazing Grace, to Ireland in the 400s and St. Patrick and Be Thou My Vision, and today to the American frontier in the early 1800s, specifically to Native American territory in what's now Minnesota, to the land of the Dakota tribe of the Sioux Nation. Joseph Renville's father was one of the many French fur traders, the voyageurs, who came to this country by way of the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes and settled near what's now St. Paul, Minnesota. And, and Mr. Renville married the daughter of a Dakota chief, Little Crow, and their son, Joseph, was born in 1779 and a few years after his birth, his mother took him along with her back to live with her tribe, the Dakotas. So as a young child, he lived with the Dakota people as one of them. And when he was about 10 years old, Joseph was sent by his father to Canada to get something of an education from a, a French priest who was living there, a missionary. And Joseph learned more of the French language and under the influence of the priest, learned about the Christian faith. Then he returned to live with his father when he was 17 or 18. And even at that young age, he was a useful interpreter or translator between the European traders who came through occasionally and the Native Americans in that area. And he married a Dakota woman in 1804 and then he took off with the explorer Zebulon Pike of Pike's Peak, 
who was investigating the source of the Mississippi River. After a few years of working as an interpreter, a translator, Joseph was made a captain in the British Canadian Army, who were by then fighting the War of 1812 against the Americans. And Renville was in charge of enlisting the help of the Dakota against the Americans, and his troops were Dakota warriors. And he was apparently an excellent soldier and was honored by the British for a job well done. He then worked as a, as a fur trader himself for the Hudson Bay Company, also doing interpreting and guide work for explorers and, and other traders in the area. And he was part of a trading post partnership and eventually set up his own trading post near a Dakota village at Lockie Park, which means the lake that speaks. And this became his home base, where he lived in, he had built a large stockaded area with several buildings, including his, a house, and he lived there with his wife and eventually eight children. And he was one of the first in the area to keep cattle and sheep, and he appears to have built up a, quite a substantial herd. He also did some farming, which was new to the Dakotas, as they were mostly hunter-gatherers who depended on the buffalo and, and other animals for their livelihood. Now, at the same time that Renville was making his living, traveling, trading, looking after his homestead and store, his trading post, there was a Presbyterian missionary in the area uh, a man named Reverend Williamson, who began to depend on Renville for, for translating and interpreting in his mission work among the Dakota. And Renville helped him to build a, a school in Lockie Park for both children and adults, and where, as happened in many places for Presbyterian uh, missionaries, a school was built and then worship services were held there in the school on Sundays. And Renville was present at these services, translating both the scripture readings and the sermon so that the assembled Dakota could understand the service. And he was instrumental in eventually producing a Dakota Bible. And it happened just a few verses at a time as Renville painstakingly listened to the French version, translated it orally into Dakota, which was an entirely oral language, which was then written down phonetically. Williamson later said about Renville that his translations were not just word for word, but that he thought carefully about the meaning of the passage and put it not only into the Dakota language, but also use the idioms of their culture. Now, I want to introduce to you another person, Mary Ann Riggs, who was a woman who joined her Presbyterian missionary husband at La Kippar. And she wrote a diary in September, in, she kept a diary, and in September 1837, she wrote, Yesterday was the Sabbath, and such a Sabbath as I had never before enjoyed. Although the day was cold and stormy and much like November, 25 Indians and part Indians assembled at 11 a.m. in our schoolroom for public worship. Accepting prayer, all of the exercises were in Dakota and French, and most of them in the former. Could you have seen those Indians kneel with stillness and order during the prayer and rise and engage in singing hymns in their own language, led by one of their own tribe, your heart would have been touched. The hymns were composed by Mr. Renville, a trader who was probably three quarters Sioux, and his son who took the lead in singing twice in the service. This diary and letter collection written over the period 1832 to 1869 by Marianne Riggs mentions Renville and his family many times. Mr. Renville brought us apples today. 
they remind me of home in Massachusetts. Or, today Mr. Renville brought two of his daughters to join our school. In 1841, Renville was ordained an elder in the Presbyterian Church. He died a few years later in 1846 at his home in La Quipa. Of his children, one became a missionary himself, one a pastor of a church, two others served as elders in the Presbyterian Church, a, a daughter married a Dakota preacher, a grandson became a minister, as did a great-grandson. The relations, of course, between the Sioux and the white Americans deteriorated, as they did all over the country, as there was increased pressure to take, to take their land and confine the Native Americans to reservations. Ranville was an, an ameliorating factor between the Dakota and the missionaries in La Quipaw. And, and he prevented the local Dakota from participating in the bloodiest of the retaliations for loss of land and broken promises. But as you know, the overall history of the relationship between the, the settlers from the East and Native Americans was, the relationship was not a good one. And Renville and his descendants were important intermediaries in that relationship in what became the states of, of Minnesota and North Dakota. And even in the midst of numerous poor choices by the powers that were in Washington, the Renvilles helped to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ, his good news, to many who had not heard it. The states of both Minnesota and North Dakota they both have a county named for Renville, and eventually a battleship also was named for him as well. Like Lydia in Philippi, Joseph Renville in Lockheed Park had a business to run and a secular life to lead. But that secular life was given purpose and meaning and value by his devotion to his faith and the commitment to share that faith with others. In a sense, Renville's vocation was, it was Christian hospitality, welcoming others, whether they were missionaries or explorers or traders or Dakota families, all in the name of Jesus Christ. He shared the love of God through his devotion to translation so that the word of God could be brought to the Sioux by his welcome of the people he worked with, and by his interpreting, his translating, so that the barrier of different languages could be overcome, helping to bring understanding and connection between different peoples. Renville's secular life became sacred, a vocation, because he did it, lived it with faith and commitment to the gospel. All of us have a Christian vocation. Sometimes it's outwardly obvious, like, like mine. But happily, God does not have to rely only on the obvious to do the work of the kingdom. All of us have lives that become purposeful, meaningful, valuable, when we live them in the name of and in the service of our Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we tend to separate our lives into church and then everything else. Teach us to live our lives, including the everything else, as vocations, callings, to serve in whatever kind of work we do, in whatever things we do each day, your kingdom, your love, and your son. We pray in his name. Amen. Now, if you're interested in reading more about Renville, I have a brief history of his life put together by the Renville County Historical Society. I also have that collection of letters and the diary 
of the Presbyterian missionary's wife, Marianne Riggs, which is a harrowing but very readable story of a life of faith and hardship and devotion and culture shock in the wilds of Minnesota before it was called Minnesota. Our hymn is called Many and Great, O God, Are Thy Things. It's one of the hymns that was written by Joseph Renville. He wrote the words himself and probably adapted the tune from a traditional Dakota tune, which is named for Renville's home village, La Kipa. We'll join in singing that hymn. Eternal God, we pray that you would help us to pray. Take our minds from everything that would distract us. Take away our fears. Take us from our apprehension about tomorrow. Take from us our resentments and our unrighteous anger. Instead, may we be bathed by your love. Remind us that your love will not let us go. We offer you our gratitude for your many mercies given us so generously. Help us to use and appreciate each day as your gift to us. We thank you that we live in a land which has been so blessed with abundance. Help us to count our blessings and to always give you thanks. When Jesus told his disciples to feed the people gathered around him, he had compassion on them. When he came to his friends in the storm, he calmed their fears. We thank you that you care about food and fear, two of our most enduring concerns. Feed us, calm our fears as we go from day to day. Help us to trust that you walk with us. We are grieving, O oh Lord. We've lost someone important to us. We know that Tom is in your care, but still we mourn. Comfort, we pray, his family. Comfort us. Remind us that none of us is ever outside your house or your love. We pray for the folks on our prayer list, for those we name now. Give them your healing. Let their bodies and minds and hearts know the new life that you give to all of us in Jesus Christ. 
We pray, O oh God, that you give us the will to share our gifts in order to make our world a better place. Use our churches and expand our ministries. When we would be tempted to falter, give us courage and a greater vision. Give us the courage to be your faithful people. O oh God, we pray for our world and all its people and leaders. May each nation include in its self-interest the least of our sisters and brothers. And may each nation aspire to peace and goodwill. May the world's leaders aspire to peace. We pray all this in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.